Hey, it's Rod Yates here. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Humans of Music, a Jackster podcast. Each episode, I talk to a music creator or industry professional about their life and career, the ups and downs of their journey, and the lessons they've learned along the way. And my special guest today is Amal and the Sniffers frontwoman, Amy Taylor. So Amal and the Sniffers came together in 2016, but they didn't really form, they just kind of fell together. They were sharing a house in Melbourne and had a jam one afternoon when they ended up writing and recording four songs in the space of a few hours. They uploaded them to Bandcamp the next day, called the EP Giddy Up, and just like that, Amal and the Sniffers were born. Their only goal at that point was to play a few shows and get some free booze, but things have ended up going a little bit better than that. The band's mix of raw punk and fiery rock and roll has got rave reviews around the world. They've played some of the world's biggest festival stages. Their self-titled debut album won an ARIA award, which is the Australian equivalent of a Grammy. And they've achieved all this without changing or doing anything to court the mainstream. Amy's story is also pretty remarkable. She grew up living in a shed in a small town on the east coast of Australia called Mullumbimby, which is known more for hippies and dope smoking than fiery punk rock. We talk about her upbringing in this interview, as well as Amal and the Sniffer's unlikely success and the steep learning curve that's come with it. But we started by talking about the band's new album, Comfort To Me. How would you compare the feeling to releasing your first album as opposed to releasing your second? Does it feel any different? Well, it's hard to kind of pinpoint exactly what's different because everything's so different. And this is kind of the only timeline of life that has happened. But the first album, it's like that was off the back of touring for like two years straight, essentially. So... We would, like, write the songs, we would road test the songs. You know, it was just a completely different feeling and then we released it and we are just touring constantly, whereas this one, it's like we played five gigs in 18 months and um, wow. And we won't really be playing gigs so much around the release either. Well, you know, at all. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, how do you get your mind around that? Do you just have to accept it? Yeah, pretty much. It just is what it is and um, that's all right. In terms of the songs that made the record, so were they written during that touring cycle or did you do all the writing while you were off the road? Yeah, most of them were written off that touring cycle. So, like, we finished September 2019 pretty much, um, like, overseas stuff, and then we started writing the album then. So I think a couple of them were road tested. I think actually just Guided by Angels was and the rest of them haven't been played Okay. Do you reckon all of that road work that you did, though, that two years of touring, did that play into the sound of the album? I think so. I think it just fine-tuned everybody's craft slightly. Like, just naturally, if you do something five days a week, it's like you will get slightly better, hopefully. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And can you hear that in the record? Are there particular songs where you'd think, ah, this is going to go really well live, or we need this in the set, or we need this kind of mood? To be honest, I've never really considered it. It's just kind of like, oh, this is... Like, this feels good to play right now. This sounds good to me right now. Ideally, I'd like to shove all of them in because it's way funner to play music that uh, is new than just, like, repeating the same thing constantly. So all of them have got a vibe that I'd like to play. I think songs like Capital would go off live just because it's so rowdy and so um, powerful um, in terms of just, like, even just, like, the drum beat and stuff like that, just the way it rolls. Yeah, and um, I think Capital is the song that has the lyric comfort to me in it. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Is that why you, was was there something particular about that song or did you just like that phrase? I just like that phrase and I like that it's kind of like an Easter egg. So it's like if people haven't heard the album yet, by the time they get to song number six, it'll go comfort to me. And they're like, that's the title, followed by a question, which is what does that even mean? What reasons do we persevere? It's just kind of saying like we just exist and there's no meaning behind it, but we just do it. (laughs) <laughs> is is that your is that your take on life? Pretty much, yeah. I don't yeah. really believe there's like um, a definite meaning, and I feel like most meanings are just kind of like illusions that we hold on to and um, run with because it's easier to enjoy life when you have something that means something to you. Right. When when do you reckon you developed that ethos? I don't know, but it it definitely turned more cynical over the last year. I was just like, oh yeah. It's all crap. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Well, one, one of the lyrical themes on the record seems to, like there seems to be a real defiance to, to some of the lyrics and also, um, you know, w- wanting to prove people wrong. You know, I'm thinking of a song like Laughing where you've got that line, everyone is laughing at me. So you're kind of acknowledging that there is, you know, that sort of feeling 
But then you've got a song like Choices, you know, my voice, my own, my life is my own, I own it. And don't need a cunt like you to love me, which has got that lyric. I'm a businesswoman, run my own company. I don't need to kiss ass. My success speaks for me. <laughs> <laughs> which is so cool. I mean, do you feel, is there an element of you that um, feels underestimated and that you need to prove people wrong? I think so, yeah. I definitely feel like that. I've had so many different, like, variations of people assuming that, you know, I'm one-dimensional or, like, that... Um, you know, oh, like, oh, people only come to your gigs because you wear short shorts. Like, um, you know, I don't like female singers, but I like the way you dance on stage. Like, all that kind of stuff. Or, you know, you're not this, you're not that. Just all these assumptions and all these, like, ideas that I'm just one-dimensional. And it's like, I know for a fact that I'm not. And it's like, I like dressing slutty, but I also like reading books. And it's like, I like wearing track pants and I can also be a dumb cunt. Like, it's like, I'm many different things. And, um, you know, that's why... I feel that way because it's kind of going like I've had my experiences and that makes me who I am now and I will continue to have different ones to you. So if it, for a bunch of like people I don't know to assume something about me and then try and like steer my life or give me unsolicited advice about that is very strange to me because frankly it's like, who are you, bro? <laughs> Absolutely. And has that intensified since the band has become popular? Because, you know, you've got people writing about you now and you're in front of people. Have you felt that that sort of intensified? Uh, I feel like it probably barely existed prior to the band, if I'm honest. Like it existed to a degree, but I guess it's just like a part of my life is other people's perspectives and um, reactions and stuff like that. So, which isn't a bad thing because it just shapes the way I think about stuff and it's just realistic. Hmm. Do you think, has the success of the band helped with, I guess, self-empowerment? Has it sort of helped you believe in yourself a little bit more or did you already have that self-belief prior? Uh, I think I always had self-belief. So now it's just like a bizarre kind of abstract. Like to me, it's like I feel like the band's done really well. Obviously, like someone like Rihanna or like fucking, I don't know, like Jet would be like, eh. oh, no, maybe not Jet. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. But like it, it's all about perspective really. So for me, it's like I think I've done really well so far and have created so many amazing different experiences and that. So the self-belief is it's just bizarre. I can't really, it's not tangible. It's yeah. abstract. One of the songs on the album, Knifey, which is, has kind of got it's a really weary, sort of quite dramatic feel to it, uh, quite, kind of a, almost a moody feel to it as well. And it's got that lyric, out comes the night, out comes my knifey. This is how I get home nicely. What inspired that song? Um, that's kind of my response to like what it's like as a female and like the general fear we have of like, Something so simple, like literally walking home as the sun's gone down is like actually a big threat. And it's so easy to forget how like absurd that is that like, yeah, it's like literally like Shrek or something when she has to go hide in the cave at night. You know, it's like I've always had felt like that need to carry around a weapon or be a weapon myself because it's like to exist in this world as a female, you have extra threats and it's that's just realistic. And it's kind of going like, I don't want to be a weapon. I don't want to carry a weapon. I don't want to act violently, but I will if I have to, because I would rather, um, I'd rather be safe and protected myself than to be in danger and have like harm done to me. Mm. You know, it's like, like we're violent and we act violent because we're scared, not because we're tough and not because we want to be tough or be violent, but because we feel we need to. Mm. Has there been occasions where you have had to, to use a weapon or to be violent? Yeah, to a degree, like, you know, not to go into everything too much, but, like, even just with stuff like gigs, I've had, like, people grope me, lick me, like, do all this shit, and honestly, I just hit them in the face (laughs) because I figure it's, like, if you touch me, I'll probably just respond by touching you and, like, both acts of violence, so mine will hurt more than yours. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, What the the final song on the record, Snakes, is very autobiographical, (laughs) Uh, really kind of tells your story. What what compelled you to to put your story down in that way, in that song? Uh, I don't know. I guess I was just thinking about growing up and stuff. And um, I'm mostly pretty fond of, like, my upbringing and, like, was feeling a bit nostalgic about it. And also it just gives context and why I'm like what I'm like and stuff. And um, I think it, yeah, explains my personality a fair bit as well, just, like, enjoy working and like a bit feral and like, <laughs> you know, just all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you grew up in Mullumbimby and for, for people who aren't from Australia and don't know what Mullumbimby is like, how would you describe it? When I was growing up, it was like hippie meets bogan. Bogan, I guess you could parallel to like a redneck. It, like they like cars and like swearing and beer and barbecues. 
Um, and yeah, hippie vegan farmer. Um, it's a, it's a lot different now. Like it's quite gentrified like most places, but, um, it still has that element. And I grew up kind of out of town. The town is pretty much just two streets in Mullumbimby, uh, lots of weed smokers. And I grew up just out of town, um, on like three acres. And my parents moved there from Western Sydney and then like built a shed that me and my sister, my mum and my dad all shared until we were nine. Um, while dad was building a bigger house, which he built out of um, like rocks that he stole from around the area. Really? <laughs> yeah, he used to drive around in his truck all the back streets and put um, oh, in his ute and put big rocks in it. <laughs> really? <laughs> what you, so it was a rock, it was a house built of rocks. Yeah, like the whole bottom half of it is rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so if anyone wanted to know who'd stolen their rocks, they just had to come and see your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, it was like the area is like quite humid um, and it's like 15-minute drive to the beach. So it's like it's a, just like a, a mixing pot of a bunch of different things. And my yeah. parents are probably like a bit hippie but a bit bogan too, so that's, yeah. What took them from Western Sydney to Mullumbimby? I don't know what took them exactly, but I think the story was dad and mum were dating and then they met at the Panthers League Club for anyone in Sydney. <laughs> um, and then Dad was like, I'm going up north. You want to come? And she was like, okay. And then they just left. And that was it. And that was pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the shed that you mentioned that you lived in until nine, was it legitimately a shed? It was like a barn, like just, yeah, like made out of wood. Two stories. Top, the top story was just one bedroom and the bottom story was just oh, like a square. Right. It was like, yeah, we used to like, you know, it's like, would use the bath water to like I can't remember what the fucking cycle was, but something like you use the bath water to wash the clothes and then water the plants with the bath water. Like it was all very like like that kind of vibe. So really self sustained. Yeah, yeah. So were you? I mean, did you have power and electricity and stuff? And yeah, we had power and and, um, and all that. Like we had blackouts all the time, but we had okay. power. <laughs> <laughs> and as per the song's title, Snakes, you mentioned that there were snakes. Were there snakes everywhere? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I showed mum the song, I said it to her and she just, she called and she was like, yeah, when you said that snakes that many times, I thought there really was a lot of snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you didn't, it didn't bother you as a kid? Oh, it scared me a fair bit. I remember once I was on the bathroom and I turned around to flush and there was a python, you know, like, Literally like the size of, um, I don't know, like a small plate and like about two metres long sticking its head through. And out, I was, of the ah! toilet, out of the toilet? Out of the toilet? Out of the toilet window. So it's like I was sitting on the, on the bathroom and it, and it was right there. <laughs> <laughs> Just part, part of growing up in Mullumbimby. Yeah, but, you know, it's like you know which ones are dangerous. Like there's like the green tree snakes which aren't and then there's like the pythons that will kill your chickens but they won't hurt you. And then there's like the ones that chase you and stuff. <laughs> did you encounter any of them i can't remember which one now but it's either like the black snake or the brown snakes territorial so they'll only be like one in the area and um and yeah they'll like they kill a bunch of our cats and stuff like that right so how do you reckon that shaped you i mean is it possible to even quantify just that just that kind of upbringing how that made you as a person do you reckon i don't know it probably explains why i'm a bit of a weirdo um but <laughs> i don't know it's hard to yeah quantify maybe that'll be some introspect for the next um pandemic or world war three or something <laughs> world war three <III. laughs> yeah. so your dad was a crane driver from from yeah. what i understand and he worked yeah. at the worked at the rubbish tip he did for a bit yeah oh, no, I don't, I, he didn't work there but he would go um like collect stuff from there ah okay there's like there's like um like tip shops yeah. so there'd be like little goodies in there yeah I remember it's one of my favourite places to go as a kid was the tip. Yeah, yeah. You just never knew what you were going to find. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so and so your mum worked at the post office, is that right? She worked at the post office um, and she studied like really hard the whole time. So she'd work there and then she studied for like seven years because she like really loves learning and stuff. So she now she's a child play psychologist. Oh, so yeah. she, right. So she got her psychology degree and yeah, yeah. wow. Which is awesome, yeah, because she worked so hard for that. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and were your parents music fans? Was there much music when you were growing up? Not really. Like, they're not, um, like, it'd just be like, oh, 20 best beer songs or, like, you know, <laughs> best hits of Queen. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, like, real entry-level stuff. Yeah, like, a lot of, like, Kmart compilations, you know, like, 
barbecue playlist with like, or like um, car show, rockabilly, that would yeah. be like three CDs and stuff like that. So it's like Kiss and George Thorogood and, and all that kind of stuff? Pretty much, yeah. Right. Blood ACDC, yeah. And were you, like when you got to a stage where you wanted to make your own music decisions and, and start finding your own music, how did you find that music and who did you gravitate towards? Well, honestly, like I actually just like listen to Triple J a little bit because that I, I was like a person out of the city. It's like I forget now because I live in Melbourne and like I kind of have access to like, you know, FBI and PBS and Triple R radio stations and stuff. But um, Triple J gave me like some shaping. But as well, someone just took me to like um like a hardcore show when I was about 13 or 14. It's just an all ages hardcore show. And my kind of just love was in live music heaps. Because I just, any band I'd say, I just, like, loved them, even if they were absolutely crap. And um, <laughs> I just loved, like, yeah, live music and, like, the atmosphere around it and everything like that. So yeah. that kind of shaped me more than anything, I think. And, like, you know, even if I bought their CDs after they played, I was like, this is crap. But when it was live, it was so good. Like, yeah. I just really loved that. Um, but then as well, I'd buy, like, yeah, Best of Slayer, Best of Ice Cube. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so though because there was quite a big hardcore scene in Byron Bay for a while wasn't there maybe there still is I don't know but but near Mother yeah. Booby, there was quite a big scene around the the youth center I think Parkway Drive yeah. sort of came up that way and yeah I used to go to the youth center all the time uh that's my like favorite thing to do right and did you see Parkway Drive back in the day I didn't see Parkway Drive. I saw bands like Amity Affliction and, like, I remember seeing a band, I think it was called, like, Sick People or something, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. It was just, like, this dude covered in chains, just, like, it was, like, very Gigi Allen kind of vibe. So now I would have been, like, 15, and I was like, fuck, and hell. <laughs> <laughs> but there was something about it that really drew you to it, just the energy maybe or, or that, that out, outlet that it provided? Yeah, I think both of those things as well as just, like, the aggressions, I really liked that, like, they were expressing their aggression and, like, it was, like, the, like, yeah, the violence to it and, like, all that kind of thing. I just felt like, yeah, I want to be seeing this and, like, expressing this and, like, I don't know, it just really psyched me up and, um, yeah, that's basically as simple as it goes. Yeah. So you'd be, I think I've read interviews where you've said you'd be in the pit like you'd just be slamming it against, yeah. like slamming up against dudes and just going nuts. So, yeah, yeah. So that was, I mean, why do you think um, have you just had a lot of energy as a kid? Is that where that, and it just was a good funnel for that? I guess so, yeah. I mean, I've always been pretty like high energy and stuff and like, you know, all that kind of thing. I don't exactly know. I just, as well, it's like I just liked that everyone was just showing their anger, maybe because like my mum is such a hippie town and like most of the stuff, that was it was all like you know love each other and like all that blah 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 but like which is awesome and necessary but at the same time it's like but you can't love everyone and like anger is dope and powerful and like it's a part like if you feel angry at something you know to like avoid it or like you know I don't know you know what I mean as in Mm. I don't know let's just make it up an example if you feel angry at the price of like bread then you can be like the bread price needs to go down. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and it's it's like a, I was going to say, it's, it's it's a legal outlet for that violence. It's just somewhere yeah. where you can get in there and, and go nuts. Yeah, because generally, like, uh, you know, I've never been seriously hurt and I feel really safe in those places because it's like just because I know what, what happens. It's like if somebody falls down, you help them up. And if somebody hurts himself, you, you're like, usually it's like everyone just makes room for them and tries to help them and like, it's, it's like this big consensual, like, a, aggression at life that nobody actually is angry at anybody else there. Mm. And they're like, say, you know, say I get pushed really hard. No, they're not mad at me. They're just like, you know, just they care about it. And, you know, they're not they're not my enemy. Yeah. And was that almost a bit of a blueprint for how you wanted Amel and the Sniffers gigs to go? Yeah, definitely. Just because my favourite kinds of shows were the ones that were, like, sweaty and rowdy and, like, hectic. So when we started playing, I was like, well... I want that in my audience, so I'll lead by example and just be like turbo and like rowdy and like <laughs> that'll get everybody else, like that gives us permission for everyone to get rowdy too. Yeah, yeah. So when you're going to these shows, is it at any point are you thinking, man, I, I could be up there, I'm going to get a band, I'm going to start singing? Uh, mostly not so much. I remember, yeah, I've said this story a couple of times, but there was like a merch girl selling merch and I'd be like, oh, well, maybe I could sell merch. I never really saw females on stage that much. I always thought like, 
fuck yeah, that'd be so fun to do. And like, I could do that and I could do it better. But I'd, at the same time, I was like, well, I probably, I'd love to be a merch girl because that's like, that's, that's what my role would be. That's almost a bit sad that that's, yeah. that that's, that's what you saw as the opportunity for you. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, that would be, that, that's how I could be a part of this all is like, I could sell the Vans merch, which yeah. is, you know, I've also done my time selling merch and it's fun, but at the same time, it's like, it shouldn't be like that. No. So is that one thing that you're finding now that you're fronting Amel and the Sniffers and, you know, you're touring the world and you're in front of girls and women and guys, you know, men, you're in front of an entire audience. Are you sensing that for some of these women or girls that you're becoming a bit of a role, a role model that they're seeing you on stage and, and thinking, well, I could do that? Uh, I'm not really sure how other people think about that, but, you know, like, I guess, the boys have said that they've like talked to people after or whatever and they've gone like, oh, Amy's such an inspiration to me. She makes me feel powerful. Like she makes me feel really empowered and stuff like that. So again, it's like something I can't really comment on because I don't know how other people think, but I think to a degree it's like, yeah, just be leading by example and like, you know, it's just giving permission or like showing people that you don't need permission to do what you feel like doing, I guess, mainly. You don't have to ask permission from the blokes to do something. You just do it and then, if they can follow, then that's great. But if they can't, then you'll still do it. Yeah, absolutely. So at this space, so you're still at school while you're going to these hardcore shows, and so obviously 15 or so. What were you? What were you like at school? <laughs> I don't know. Pretty similar to what I'm like now. I think just like I liked the learning part, but like I also like socially, I didn't struggle, but I struggled because I was just doing my thing, and like I didn't. I really like didn't like the authority and being told what to do and stuff like that but at the same time I probably had like better relationships with my teachers than I did with like my peers and yeah when I got my license I just like sit in my car at lunch and eat by myself because I wanted to and just like listen to music and stuff like that like I remember there was like I at the end of the school I just went to public school but at the end of school there was like these fake awards given out and mine was the I just want to pass award because like I've (laughs) I figured out the exact amount of days that I could go to school and not go to school so that I wouldn't get expelled or, like, lose my high school certificate. So right. I'll just do that. <laughs> <laughs> and is that where that line in Snakes come from? Um, wasn't a loser, definitely a loner. Is that how it yeah. felt to you? Yeah, I, I bet so. Like, I always felt, like, pretty confident and, like, chatty and, like, I really like chatting with a bunch of people and was, like, pretty much, like, surface-level friends with a bunch of people. But I guess just the main thing was when I was 6, 16, I, like, they like an event kind of happened and like I lost a bunch of friends because of it. Um, just I like got this new partner and he was like, a, well, he's like a fucking idiot. Um, and so I just like isolated myself really. And yeah, I just like had a falling out with friends about it and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, yeah. that's why I was a loner mainly. After the break, Amy talks about the band's first show, their early overseas tours and her memories of recording their debut album. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Amy Taylor. So 18 or 19, you moved to Melbourne. Yeah. To do what? What's your plan? <laughs> I didn't really have one. I was like, I just want to uh, get to the city or whatever. I moved to Laverton, which is like a, a really, really small suburb outside of Melbourne, about 40 minutes. And I got a couple of weird jobs. Like I worked at the Laverton um, RSL or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I only did a couple of shifts there and I found it like pretty intimidating and so I bailed on that. And then I got an apprenticeship at BOC, which is a chemical company. Right. Um, where, where I was like, yeah, it was just like chemical cylinders that you would roll out to tradespeople during the day. Um, I did that for a couple of months, but it was like $11 an hour. The, the blokes were pretty nice. Like they'd buy me coffee and stuff, but I was like, this is not really like, I'm not really going to go anywhere doing this. And I didn't like getting up every day so early. So I was like, I was like, I'm just going to go to TAFE and study um, business. And I was like, well, I like music, so I'll study music business. But honestly, I had no plan when I came to Melbourne. Okay. Did you did yeah. you end up studying music business? Yeah, I did a diploma in music business at TAFE. Okay. And did you yeah. learn did you learn things there which have helped guide you in in Amel? Uh, I learned bits and bobs, but honestly, it was a pretty um, average course. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I just did it because I knew that I could get on Centrelink and um, and also, like, get my brain in that way. But the way that that helped me was just, like, yeah, like, uh, I got, like, a job at a rehearsal space and I got a job as a venue booker for a bit. Um, and so I did get, like, some 
some some some stuff from it. Yeah. So again, it's music. You're being pulled towards music. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, are you living with um, Bryce, who who would go on to be the drummer at this point? Yeah, I'm living with Bryce, and I'm living with Callum, who's the first bass player. Ah, okay. So did you know Bryce? Because he was from Byron Bay as well. Did you know him prior to moving to Melbourne? Yeah. So Callum and Bryce, they're both from Lennox Head and I kind of knew them peripherally or whatever. But yeah, when I moved down to Melbourne, um, we all got a house in Laverton together. And then shortly after that, probably like maybe like a year or so, we, I moved to St Kilda with them both. Okay. And is that where you met Deck and Fergus? No. Nah, yeah, pretty much. Bryce and I met Deck at a pub one night. And just became friends after that. And then Deck met Gus at a pub another night. And then, yeah, when Callum decided to be leaving the band. He also has another project now called Candy, if anyone wants to support that. Um, but when um, Callum left the band, Deck just called up Gus, who was living in Tasmania at the time, and was like, do you want to play bass in our And he was like, ah, oh, I guess so. And then, <laughs> like, he just got his mate to teach him how to play the songs. <laughs> <laughs> so the the I guess the very famous story about how you came together is that one after you had a drum kit in your room in the house and one afternoon you all just came back and you just decided to let's play a few songs and you, yeah. you wrote you wrote a bunch of songs recorded them that night and the next day put them up onto Bandcamp is that how it worked Yeah straight up I got home probably at like 4 Callum was setting up all the gear in my room Callum and Deck, who were playing bass and guitar, couldn't hear each other because it was all DI. So they would, like, write the song and then record it, like, you know, 15 minutes later and they couldn't even hear each other play. <laughs> um, and I just had, like, some notes scribbled in my a book and, like, would read that and then, like, kind of riff off that a little bit. We recorded it by, like, 11. Then we, like, looked through some phone photos. We're like, that should be the EP cover. Pick the band name and put it up the next day. That's so good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who's, whose idea was Amal and the Sniffers? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember think like the thought process was like, well, my name's Amy Louise and on my license it says Amel and then the boys also sniff Amel all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, because this is the first time that you've ever sung at this point, never fronted a band. Like who are you um, drawing on for inspiration? Are there any other singers that you're thinking that you're modelling yourself on or, or what? I don't know. I really like the Cosmic Psychos and I like Eddie Current's Oppression Ring and I liked, um, I didn't really like The Runaways and I liked Lemmy. (laughs) 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 So that's a pretty obvious influence. (laughs) (laughs) No, um, so yeah, it's like a bit of a a mixed pot, but I also just wasn't really thinking about anything too much and, and it was all just kind of like, oh, I'll just do this and do that. And even bands like X Ray Specs, who like is now one of my favourite bands, it's like I didn't know they existed until someone at a gig was like, "Oh, you must be like Polystyrene." I was like, "Who's that?" And right. then like Googled it and was like, "Fuck, this is sick." That's awesome. I love how organic that is because you know a lot of people they get into music or they form a band because they want to make it. Whereas, yeah. whereas that just does that. I know that was not your <laughs> your goal at that point. Yeah, definitely not. And at the same time, it's like. I'm super ambitious and like dream pretty big and like am excited by like opportunities and really want like exciting opportunities and stuff. So it's like even though we didn't want to make it, it's like we always had that like excitement and drive to like, oh, what's the next thing? Like what, where can we go next? Like what can we try and do next or whatever? Mm. So that Giddy Up EP, that one that you recorded and released even yeah. within a 12 hour space what, yeah. in 2016, what do you think of that now? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't listened to it in ages. I think I should probably listen to it again, but <laughs> it's always funny like chatting about it or whatever because then it's like it sounds really like amazing and great that we've done this thing so quickly, but then it's like literally one of the songs is 47 seconds long. <laughs> <laughs> Short but sweet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what do you remember of your, the first, the band's first show? There's like two shows and I can't remember which one was the first one, but I think it was... I think we played at Yaya's, which is an upstairs venue in Melbourne, um, and I think we played for about 10 to 15 minutes. And to me it felt really busy and really packed and really exciting, and I really, I just loved it. I was like, fuck, this is so dope. I mean 10 to 15 minutes, was that because that's all that you, you knew at that that's, point? I think we literally covered, because um, Deck was in another band called Jurassic Nark and Callum was in another band, so I think we literally covered 
one of each of their other band songs because <laughs> otherwise it would literally be like a seven minute set. <laughs> well, because this is pretty pretty soon after you record that EP, right? It's just like a week I later or something. It was like a week later, yeah. But yeah. our friend Pablo, he was like booking at Yaya's and needed an opener. I think it was like it might have even been like a two a.m. slot. Oh wow! Um, where we were opening for another band, I, I can't remember exactly, but yeah. You're opening at two a.m. Yeah, they were doing these like two a.m. shows wow. for a while, which was really fun. <laughs> and I think I'd read that there was a chip tooth. At that first show that you chipped a tooth and there was a bit of blood and it was it sounded oh, like a rowdy affair. I can't remember. Oh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah, no. I think somebody, yeah, somebody called Fuzz Sucker. It's such a vague memory. But I feel like maybe someone called Fuzz Sucker chipped a tooth and he was wearing a white and then there was blood everywhere. I Fuck. can't remember exactly. Poor Fuzz Sucker. That's... <laughs> <laughs> so how did you, how are you feeling though at this point? You're fronting a band, like you're you're out front. Do you feel powerful? What does it feel like to be the singer? Yeah, it feels powerful. I felt like a sick cunt. I was like, fuck yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and it was immediate though. You thought, I want to do more of this. Yeah, definitely. I was like, ah, oh, this is fun. This feels good. I like this. When did you get the feeling that it's taking off and that people are getting into it? Um, I. Probably been just like a bit, um, like pretty much even just like when we get played on one radio public station in in Melbourne. I thought we were huge then. Like I was like, well, doesn't get much better than this, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we've made it, <laughs> you know. And like you'd like see on Bandcamp that like forty eight people had listened, and we were like, look out! Like, <laughs> like we, I really just genuinely believed that like all that that stuff was like massive. You know, as well because, like, before being in the band, I'd never been to a venue that was more than, like, 150 capacity, really. So mm. it's like you'd see, like, half-filled 100-capacity venue and you'd think, like, oh, boy, yeah, we've hit the big time. <laughs> but see, that, that's exciting, though, right? Even though you look back now and you think it was a half-full venue, but at the time, that's super exciting. That's really exciting. And it's like, you know, I feel like it's so important to just, like, even though I wasn't aware of what was going on at the time but at some point they just be excited by all that stuff and like we all just literally started to like try and get free tickets to bands because if you're supporting them you get in for free and, and you get <laughs> and like you know especially the boys but it's like you get free drinks as well you don't have to pay for your drinks yeah. <laughs> so, so like any of that stuff like I remember yeah like Cosmic Psychos got us to open at the corner for them once and like I was like far out we are going going for gold <laughs> <laughs> and did you meet them? Yeah, yeah, we're great friends now. I love those guys. That's awesome. That's yeah. so cool. As you're, because, you know, going from the kind of music that you said your mum and dad liked, did they like bands like the Cosmic Psychos and, and have they seen you support them? No, they didn't really know who the Psychos were uh, and I don't think they said support them either. Okay, fair. Have they seen yeah. you play though? Yeah, they've seen me play, yeah. How do they, how do they go with that? Pretty good. I think they're like, woohoo. That's rocking. Like, I, just, <laughs> I don't know. So, in 2017, you released the next EP, um, Big Attraction, and a year later, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard take you on tour in the US. I think it's about a 22 date tour around the US. How, I mean, what are you thinking at that point? And, and how big a shift is that for you in terms of having to adapt to serious touring? Yeah, um, that was quite, yeah, that was actually quite intimidating because, like, uh, it was just so unknown to all of us. Like the longest tour we'd done before that was like five days on the East Coast split up over like three weekends, which is yeah. like, bit, you know, that's it was just not that hard work. And, um, yeah, that was our first overseas tour where we started in the UK and did like six or seven dates there. And then, yeah, 22 dates over 23 days in America. And that was supporting King Gizzard, which was so, you know, it's like them taking us on that tour. It's like we're just kind of forever thankful because that was really like, helped us out um and supported us but yeah um it was yeah it was just intimidating like their shows were so big and stuff there were so many people and it was so it was so exciting and like I always really love playing in front of people that probably don't know us that don't like us and like just getting the mixed reactions and like trying to win people over like I like the challenge of that yeah and just like showing people some different genres and stuff like I remember somebody messaging us after that show being like hey, I've never really had punk music before and I don't know where to look, but I saw you guys with Gizzard, like, can you recommend some bands? Like, that kind of stuff. And it's like, that's dope. That's um, awesome. Yeah, but it, it was it was mainly just, like, fun and really sweet because um, 
but it was just intimidating because it was just nothing like we'd ever done before. Yeah. What are some of the biggest lessons you reckon you learned just to actually even do 22 dates in a row like that? I don't know what I learned. I'm still really learning how to like navigate to it properly and stuff like that because it's so, such a bizarre lifestyle. Uh, but I learned how to hold a microphone properly. <laughs> 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 how how do you do that? <laughs> Not pointing it at the monitors, <laughs> right in front of your mouth. <laughs> well, that's a solid lesson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about just even you know the, the mental health of being away for that long and being? Were you in a tour bus or what? How are you traveling? Oh, it was so funny. Yeah, they because obviously they'd like been working so hard for years and like they've established themselves, and so they were in the tour bus. Whereas this was our first tour, so we were in a van. We still travel in a van at this stage too. Um, but we're in a van, <laughs> so they would drive overnight and get to the venue. And then we had um, this hilarious icon called Henry Brister as our tour manager. It was just like this crazy man with like he had like long goatee on, uh, goatees on either side of his chin, and like he bought these big, big um, leather latex boots that went up to his knee, and like he'd be speed along the highway, slapping himself in the face, trying not to go to sleep. Um, <laughs> and yeah, he'd like get up. It would, like, pull over really hastily on the highway and start doing push-ups on the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Did you manage to sleep or are you just keeping an eye on him? Um, we all had a nap once and I remember waking up and he was on the wrong side of the road coming off the highway because obviously we're from Australia, so he's, like, driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> we're like, fuck, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. What about you always hear these stories about, um, you know, I guess US truck stops where you might pull into at two in the morning or three in the morning to, because obviously to fuel up, but to get someone to eat. And, and it sounds like, you know, when I've spoken to bands in the past, they've always had some pretty interesting encounters in those, those sorts of places. Does anything spring to mind for you? Not specifically, but I remember once we were staying in this hotel in like, yeah, really Southern America. And all the boys with their like little mullets and they're tucked, they're like all skinny and scrawny and they got their tucked in shirts. <laughs> and this like southern lady was at, was at the reception, this older southern lady, and they walk past and they're like, oh, we're just checking out. She, she like cracked that laugh. She's like, I thought you were the pizza boy. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a bit of culture shock. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so when you go in to do your first album then, you know, you've laid this groundwork uh, and there's a bit of a buzz about you. How are you feeling recording that first album, knowing that, you know, this has gone already gone a lot further than you'd expected? Honestly, at that time, I was just bloody buggered. Like we, they, we re recorded that album up at the back of a three month tour. So we'd already been away for three months and just like, yeah, haven't been home in ages and stuff like that. Just like full road dog brain. And um yeah, we recorded it in Sheffield in the UK with um, mm. Ross Orton, who was absolute legend, and his trusty sidekick Dave, who was there uh, as well. Right. And it was just like fucking freezing, and the sun would like rise at like 11 a.m. and set at like 3 p.m. and we had to go piss outside because there was a, only a toilet outside. And honestly, <laughs> I was just buggered when I was recording it, so I didn't really think that much um, about anything but just like getting it done. <laughs> But we did have some, like, you know, would, like, to take us to the pub every evening and stuff like that and show us some, like, cuisines, like, um, fucking, what are those things called? Some egg. What are they called? Like a um, deviled egg or something? Or? Yeah, it's like some deviled eggs and um, just, like, weird little Sheffield snacks. And, yeah, they really showed us a good time, but we were just, all of us were just pretty fried. <laughs> Do you reckon that contributes to the sound of the record? Um, probably. There was a lot of, like, um frustration in it like the songs like control gfy and um gap that anger i think they were all pretty much written in that studio as in like i hadn't finished lyrics yet so i'd sit in the kitchen while they're recording and like come up with lyrics and stuff like that right remember yeah like gfy i just like didn't have a lyric and was like trying to record all this different stuff and was like fucking off it and then just went for this really long walk came back and then recorded that because and that was kind of like the lyrics i'd written on the walk yeah, right. So you feel you're having to deal with a lot of pressure there in that situation. Yeah, lots of pressure. As well, we'd never we'd only been in a recording room once before and that was to record an A C D C cover. So none of us had like had the recording room experience. We'd never worked with a producer before. Never yeah, never done recording before except for DIY. So um it was just kind of foreign to us and like it was just a different process. Yeah. And again, you've already come a lot further than you'd expected by this point was there did you ever just look at each other and go Man, we're recording in Sheffield right now this is nuts like <laughs> yeah. this is crazy 
Yeah, yeah. We always have those little moments. Like it always happens at strange dance when you're kind of like, like, whoa, this is so so surreal. Yeah. So the you mentioned earlier that you'd been to the biggest venues you'd been to before you joined the band were like 150 capacity, something like that. And yeah. then and then I think you start must start, is it 2020 or 2019 when you support the Foo Fighters? I think it was 2018. Oh, even. 2018. Okay. So you, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you feeling as you're walking out on stage for that show? Can you even remember? Um, uh, I can't remember, but I remember it was absolutely scorching hot, <laughs> and poor me and Gus, because like, it was right in the Adelaide blaring sun at like five pm. There was not many people there at all for us, to be honest. Like I reckon, I like you, yeah, that like that stadium wasn't even close to full. It was like borderline empty still. People were still rocking up. Right. I think on the Facebook they said that the the show started at like five thirty, and we played at five. Like there was a, like a mistake. Right. And. And so it was, like, pretty empty but pretty exciting. Um, I think we're just pumped and, like, oh, fuck, yeah. Like, and Dave Grohl watched and said he loved it and, like, Danny Green, the boxer, was there and said he liked the haircuts. And, yeah, so it was, like, it was all very exciting. And it was, like, great catering. Like, we hadn't really seen catering before and we were really blown away. Yeah, nice. Is there another situation like that where, which was a real sort of pinch me kind of moment in all your touring? Kind of all of them are pretty pinch me but... Yeah, like I, just like stuff when you like go to play and say, I don't know, LA and it's like you've sold out a 600 capacity venue and people are like, you know, really excited to see you and stuff like that. Like that's so cool to me. Like I think, oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, totally. So I mean, one of the things about this, which we talked about a little bit earlier, is that it's all very organic, but there is a work ethic in play. Like you have actually had to work hard for this and to, to set these sorts of goals. Where, where do you reckon you got that work ethic from? Probably my dad, really. I guess, like, you know, he's a working-class person and, like, you know, works six days a week and, you know, money was always... We always had to think about money to a degree and, like, he was quite worried about money and stuff like that. So, you know, if I got, like, say, I'd, like... I always had to earn my money as well. Like, so if I needed 20 bucks pocket money, like, I'm cleaning the whole fucking house. But I, I <laughs> like doing it. Like, I like cleaning the house as well. Like, it felt fun to me and I like being productive and, like, I like seeing you know, you'd have a window and then you'd wipe it and you'd see instantly the change and I really liked that. Um, okay. And, yeah, mum worked really hard as well. Like she did the post office and she studied and, like, she also was raising us and, like, yeah, dad was working, like, six days a week, five days a week and also raising us. So, yeah, and anyway, I'd get my pocket money. It'd be, like, $20 and then he'd go, like, you know, it might seem like a lot of money but it's going to go really quick. And, you know, then, then I get a job when I was, like, 14 my first job was when I was 14, it's like I'd have like $100 a fortnight or whatever. It's like, it might feel like a lot of money, but it's going to go really quick. Yeah. Like just like that kind of thing. So it's like that. But also just like I like the feeling of working and I like I actually just like the feeling of when I've done a good job and I like, you know, like when I worked at IGA, it's like I like got really good at the daily and I actually just really cared about like all these menial jobs and like I just care about it. It's like I, I wipe the deli like so good that it's like, okay, well, I can pack up the fruit and veg as well as the deli now. And I, now I can pack up the fruit and veg, the deli and do the checkouts. Like I like yeah. pushing myself. I like challenging myself and I like I like the discipline. But yeah. it also just is fun. Totally, <laughs> totally. And so, so I get IGA is a supermarket in Australia. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. How long did you work there for? I think I started when I was like 14 and nine months and then I think I've wrapped it up yeah like just before I moved to Melbourne so 18 19 about four years yeah right okay so um what you were just talking about there there's that again that line in snakes um I like to change but I know how I was raised is that kind of referencing what you just mentioned there that just that that solid upbringing and the values that you got when you were growing up um not even necessarily that not even necessarily solid like it's like I just know my I know where I'm from kind of thing which is a classic but it's like I just know that and it's like I'm different now. It's like I have a different job and like, you know, financially I'm comfortable. Thank you, job keeper, government funding 2020. But <laughs> but it's like but it's like I still am uh, like in very much so like that person and like that's really carried on and it's like that's really shaped me and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, even though it's changed and I like wear heaps of makeup and like travel the world and like I've been in business class and like done modeling for Gucci and like all this wild, wild, exciting stuff. It's like, I'm fucking different, but I also know where I'm from. Yeah. And like, I, I encourage the difference. Like I want to change constantly and I want to constantly experience different stuff and like grow and like taste all the flavors of life. Yeah. Yeah. And so is that still in, is that in your, I mean, hopefully near future, will you be able to get out of Australia and, and go and play shows? 
I hope so. I hope hopefully next year we'll be over in America and and um, in the UK and stuff like that. Like a plan going ahead, then that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah, nice one. So Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Are there people that you've give credit to for helping you get where you are today? Uh, yeah, probably heaps of them. Um, I don't know who exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you know, we have management and so we have labels and. And all those people really helped us out. Like we were DIY to an extent, but now we're just not. And we have a whole crew of people who help us. And to me, they're just all people who like love music and are working in the music industry. And, you know, just like that's a better way to spend their time under capitalism. And that's really dope. So, you know, it's like all those people have really helped us get like as many people's ears on us and as many people's eyes on us. And that's really what you want is just like we're proud of this album specifically. So it's like we just want as many people to hear it so that, we can, you know, be proud of it because you make it to share. And, um, you know, and we want as many people's eyes to come watch us. It's not a matter of, like, keeping it DIY forever and, and keeping it at, like, small, sweaty venues forever, even though I hope we can play as many of them as we can. But it's about, like, you know, just seeing who else can hear it and relate. Yeah, totally. And that DIY ethos that you just had, did you just naturally have that or did, did some of it come from the Byron Bay, like, that hardcore scene? Where do you reckon you all got that from? I don't know. I think it was just more accessible and more easy to figure out how to do it ourselves. And like, it was also just fun. Like doing stuff yourself is just fun. Like not having to rely on somebody, being independent, trying to learn stuff yourself. Like going like, oh, how can we make t-shirts? Like, oh, well, I'll just Google it and then like find this material and like make shit. Like it's cheaper usually. It's more accessible and it's, you get to use your brain and be a part of it. Yeah. Nice one. Last thing I wanted to ask you is just, I know that you're a Dolly Parton fan oh yeah yeah where did you um where did you first hear dolly <laughs> probably just the classics like jolene and stuff but then once i saw her personality and, and like the way she talked and the way she thought about the world and stuff i was like fuck yeah she's the best cut ever and then yeah like just all the music like she writes so much of it all of it herself she's like really hard working I, I think i can just relate to her in a lot of ways like as a person and like her upbringing and like yeah just like the way she sees the world so it's like that's kind of why I'm interested in it and respect her so much because she's like a more polished version of what I'd like to be. Right. Okay. So were you, um, when you were talking about earlier about going to the hardcore shows and buying, um, you know, Slayer and Ice Tea, did you also have, were you also aware of Dolly then or did this come later? Nah, not at all. I don't know. This probably only happened in the last three years. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Amy. Look, thanks so much for your time. Really great to chat to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. So, thanks for chatting with me. And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Amy for her time and thank you for listening. If you have any feedback on the show or suggestions on who you'd like me to interview or even if you just want to say hello, please drop me a line at humansofmusic at jaxta.com. That's humansofmusic, one word, at jaxta, J-A-X-S-T-A dot com. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode or even better, share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, next time you need to know who wrote a song, who produced a song, who engineered it, who played on it, who sang on it, who did anything on it, head to jackster.com for all your official music credit information. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening.